a new book, 10 Wonders of the Rosary. So you'll have to check that out. And please welcome to the stage, Father Donald Colloway. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, man, you guys are here to see me, right? Yeah. Wow, that's sweet. I was so worried. Because I, I saw the program, and I'm like, Scott Hahn, Lila Rose, Deacon Harold. I'm like, nobody's going to be at this but my mom. You know, I was, I was like, thanks, guys. Really, it means a lot to me that you came to hear me. Um, that's pretty cool. It, it, it does. It really makes me feel good. All right, so let's crank out a Hail Mary, okay, together, so that I don't say anything stupid. Because I can do that. It's not an election year, so I don't have that on my back. Uh, you, I can get in big trouble in election years. Let's pray a Hail Mary, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph, guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right. So. Um, Maybe in Scott Hahn's room, they were watching me. Who knows? Um, he's my neighbor, actually. He lives on the same street five houses down from where I do in Steubenville. So uh, he'd be cool with it, I, I guess. All right. So I got a lot of ground to cover and a short time to do it. So this is an impact session, so I got to make an impact. So I'm going to come at you hard, heavy, and aggressive, OK? Because I looked at the program, and I'm like, dude, I'm the only guy, or anybody, speaker, giving a talk about the Virgin Mary. So I got to cover all of it, OK? Yeah. All right. So are you ready to be Marianized? Are you ready to be married? Are you ready to enter the Mariosphere? Because you're going to, OK? We're going we're gonna to get serious. You're going to walk out here with a greater love for Our Lady than you've ever had before. At least that's my hope, OK? I could tell you a ton of things about the Blessed Virgin Mary because she's my lady, she's my woman, she's my princess, she's my life, my sweetness, and my hope. I love this woman. I could tell you so much, but you'll have to buy the books, okay, to find out about that. <laughs> I don't want to give you my perspective. I got one for sure, okay? But I want to give you God's perspective on Our Lady. And I can do that. Actually, you could do it too. I'm just up here, I got a Roman collar on my neck and a microphone, so you got to listen to me. But anybody could do this. See, God's not an alien off on planet Zeno, you know, in the, some strange constellation. He, he's got a divine mind, perfect, flawless. And he has done something so remarkable that I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to change a lot of maybe how you think about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay, and this is what I mean. We can know what God thinks about this particular creation of his, Our Lady, if we just use reason if we just unpack it from a rational perspective. And that's what I want to do with you to start this talk, OK? Because you've got a noggin, you've got a head, and you've got a brain in it. And you're going to be able to deduce, logically, these arguments and this understanding on your own. It's just I'm going to kind of assist you with it. And now, I didn't come up with this ability to do this. Fulton Sheen did. I actually don't come up with original stuff. I, I wish I could be original in so many of my statements. I just steal stuff from the saints. You know, it's kind of holy plagiarism, I guess. I, I give them, you know, I attribute it to them. But he did something in a book called The World's First Love, which is one of the best books about the Blessed Virgin Mary ever, okay? But I want to take it a step further. So I want you right now to imagine with me, because we're going to talk about the Virgin Mary, the masterpiece of God. I want you to imagine right now that you're God. Congratulations. <laughs> right? You just got... You're omnipotent, you're all-powerful. You're omniscient, you're, you're all-knowing. You, you're God, you're, you're, you're the real deal, okay? You created this world and given them free will and all of its beautiful places, but they jacked it up, right? And they made a mess of it. You know how the story goes. You are so good, you're not just, you didn't just wind up the clock and send it off, you know, that's, that's not the God we're talking about, that's craziness. You're so good that you're going to enter into the world, the, the world that you made that's fallen and become one of them. How are you going to do that? Rub-a-dub-dub, shazam, poof. Out of the heavens you appear as a 33-year-old Messiah ready to accomplish my saving mission, Father God, hoo Right now. That's magic. You made an anthropological order. You set things up in a system of laws. You're going to abide by that. You're not going to break it. 
So you're going to come into the world. Now, one of you, only one of you, the triune God, is going to come in. So let's just say right now that you're the Word, and you're going to enter into the world. Hey, what are you going to do? What's that mean? Well, we know what it means. You are going to make your own mom. Yeah. Okay? That's like a no-brainer, but somehow we miss that. Jesus made his own mother. Never has it been heard that a child, a son, precedes his mother, right? I didn't come before my mom, neither did you. We came after. That's just how it works. But in this instance, God made his own mom. Whoa, what does that mean? It means a lot. I want to put myself in in this uh, little experiment with you, and I'm going to act like I'm God. I'm not, trust me. Hang out with me long enough, you'll be like, ooh, pray for Father, you know. (laughs) I'm far from being divine, (laughs) you know. But for the sake of argument, what would I do if I were God and had all power, all knowledge, all ability to make my own mother? Oh, I would make her a masterpiece. I would make a flawless model of maternity, of femininity, so amazingly beautiful there would be no other creature like her. I would do this for my mom because I had the power to do it. You know, if I had this enemy called Satan, Lucifer, the devil, and I was going to make my own mother, why would I, if I were God, leave any kind of stain in her? Why would I do that? You know what I would do? Mm, Let me think of a word. What would I create my mother? Oh, yeah. Immaculate. Flawless. Absolutely ravishingly beautiful on every level is what I would do. It would make my enemy so mad because he would probably hope that I would, you know, maybe come into the world through a creature, but she'd still be a sinner. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not my mother because I'm making my own mom. Flawless, immaculate, perfect. As a matter of fact, you know what I would do? I would write a book as God, a big one. I'd call the first chapter, I don't know, Genesis. I call the last one Revelation, like apocalyptic stuff, dragons and stuff. And in that book, you know what I talk about? I would talk about my mom's delicate little female foot crushing Satan's ugly face. I'd do that. I really would. If I were God. Mm-hmm. Totally. But I wouldn't stop there. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to deprive my mother of any blessing that a woman could have. I would make my mother an immaculate creation. You know what else I would give to my mother? The gift of virginity, a perpetual virgin, as a matter of fact. I would astound the nations and make make it so that my mother was a virgin before and during my birth. That's kind of a no-brainer. That's easy to understand. But even after my birth, because if you're God, that's a temple. That womb of that woman is now a sanctuary. Nobody else abides in that sanctuary but me. I made it. That's my abode. See, to to us, we think, yeah, that is something, you know? How can a woman be a virgin and a mother? That's like contradictory. How does that even work? For us, we can't do this. But if you're God, remember, you're God, you can do this. This is nothing to you, right? You can make things pass through things without breaking their integrity. For example, if it were daytime and there were windows in here, it'd be perfect. Light passes through a window, right? Does it break the integrity of the glass? No. But it really passes through the window, leaves it intact. Who is Jesus? Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. He's God. He can do this. He can pass through things and leave the integrity of that thing intact. That's what he did to his mother's womb. That's what I would have done. Just like in the morning, God can make a flower, dew pass through a flower, and it doesn't break the integrity of the flower. It actually makes the flower fruitful. God did not deprive his mother of any blessing. Immaculate, perpetual virgin. See, this is the teaching of the church. This is what we believe. And he's not a stingy God. You can't create a masterpiece of maternity and then get stingy and say, she's all mine, mwah, suckers, right? No. You can't, if you're stingy, you're not God. What you made, you're gonna share. See, this is what I would do. If, If I had made my own mother, I would want everyone to call her mother. And I'd find a way to do it. I would probably do something crazy, like be half naked, a little elevated. And I would say to people, behold, your mother. And if you didn't get what I said, well, you got problems. 
okay? If there's any ambiguity, or uh, if that's not clear to you, I'm not sure this is working right, right? How much more clear do I need to be? Right? I'm just saying that that's what I would do, okay? That's what I would do. But I wouldn't stop there. I would make it so that my mother's name would be the most common female name in the history of the world. I would. Your culture will call your daughters Maria, and you Marie, and you Miriam, and you Mary. I would. I would like demand it. They wouldn't even be aware of it, but they'd do it. <laughs> That's what I would do. We're talking about my mom, right? But I wouldn't stop there. You know what else I would do? I would make it so that my mother would never die. Mm, you guys are going to love this one. You're going to love this one. I'm going to save how that works at the end of this talk. See, my mom and your mom, sadly, uh, someday they're, they're, they're going to die. They're not going to be here. Now, I, I say that with, I, I don't want that to happen. I love my mom. Well, when I was a teenager, we rubbed, no doubt, right? But now, she's like my best friend. I love my mom so much. The day that my mom dies, I'm going to lose it. I know I'll see her again. I have faith. But still, it's my mom. If there were a way that I could prevent my mother from going into a tomb six feet under the ground, you bet I would prevent it, because that's my mom. Well, I can't, and neither can you. You're not God, but Jesus is God, and he can, and he did, and he did it in the most ingenious way that's going to blow your mind. When you hear this at the end of this talk, you immediately are going to go on Google and be like, whoa, what was that word? Really? I'm not going to say it now because you're going to be trying to figure out how to spell it. It's amazing. Okay. That's just, remember, we're just the first person, the incarnate word. Now I want you to act like you're the father because Mary is a Trinitarian masterpiece. So now you're God the father. You're, you, you have a part in this creation. What would you be creating in the mystery of Mary? The perfect little girl, your perfect little daughter, your princess. Oh, my friends. You know as well as I do that there is nothing more beautiful on this planet than a little girl. There isn't. I've been around the world, man. I've been to New Zealand. There's no place more beautiful than New Zealand. I've been to Australia. I've been to Fiji. I've been to islands. I've been everywhere. Nothing compares to the beauty of a little girl. She's a spark of paradise. The poets talk about this. The musicians talk about this. Authors talk about this. Everybody knows this. God made the most beautiful little girl and he is so protective of her. If you mess with her, shh, shh, Papa's locked and loaded, okay? <laughs> it is not gonna go well for you, okay? Really, you know, I mean, we, we've, got, we've got understandings of this even in the Old Testament. If you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you're toast. You don't touch daddy's little girl. He loves her with a serious love, with a protective love, and she knows that. This little girl knows she's so secure in her father's love. It's not even good enough for him that she's a princess. You know what daddy's going to do for his little princess? He's going to raise up his princess and make her the queen of the universe. All men, it don't matter if you're a pope, bishop, priest, saint, bow down to the princess, to the queen of the cosmos. All angels, if you don't serve her, you're going to get your angelic face crushed too. Okay? Because <laughs> we're talking about daddy's little girl. He does amazing things for that little girl because he's madly in love with that little girl because he made her. Okay, so let's go into the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to have a say in making this masterpiece of femininity. What's the Holy Spirit going to be making? I love this one. The perfect bride. Oh, my goodness. See, this is where me as a dude, oh, yeah, right? Yes, I'm a priest, but I'm, I'm not a robot, right? I'm a natural dude, right? Naturally drawn to the feminine mystery and all of its wonder and everything. My brothers, can you imagine if you had the ability to make the perfect woman? Can you imagine what you would do? See, we as dudes, yeah. I hope you weren't sitting next to your girlfriend, bro. <laughs> Sorry. See, we think about this as, as guys. It's normal, okay? I remember when I grew up, I'm, I'm dating myself now. You guys are so young, you're probably born in this century or something, okay? When I grew up, people, there was a movie that was out called Weird Science. Two dudes cut out, you know, pieces from magazines of a girl, this part and this part, and they put it together, and they, zzz, 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 they tried to make her, and she appeared, and she was all right, you know? But God 
can make her. And he did. God made his own woman. God made his own bride. As a matter of fact, in that book I talked about that he wrote, do you know what the greatest book is in it? The Song of Songs. It's about God singing to his dove, to his princess, to his lady. God made his own lady. And he's madly in love with her. He can't get enough of her. He's ravished by her sight. Really? He is so in love with what he has made that there's never been anything like it and there never will be. As a matter of fact, he demands that she is the most painted woman in the history of the world. And it's true. You can crank out your Mona Lisa's and your so-and-so's, but they got nothing on the Madonna, the most painted woman in the history of the world. People, you know, artists, if you go to Europe and you go to the museums, you'll see pictures of pears and whatnot. That's nice, that's nice. But everybody who wants to be a true classical artist has to at least attempt a Madonna and child. Really? Everybody knew this in days of old. Now we've forgotten it and, you know, people throw, drop a pencil on the floor and call it art. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> God made her. And you know what every artist does? You've probably heard these analogies before. I think it was Michelangelo or one of them dudes when they made uh, Moses or David. They hit it with, like, their, their, their instrument and they said to it, Speak! Because you want your creation to come alive. But we don't have the ability to do that, you and I. But God does. He made a masterpiece. And he made it a living masterpiece. And you know what he did? He took up residency in the body of his masterpiece. Yeah, that's how much he loves her. Madly in love with her. Now, how much does he love her? He makes her smell like roses. He has grown men and little children when she comes on the scene fall on their knees and cry. Demons jump out windows when she comes on the scene. And God will make the sun spin like a yo-yo for his woman. <laughs> he does. Because he can. The sun. Think to God. And he makes it spin for her on occasion. Because he wants to show us who she is. She's the masterpiece of the Holy Trinity. See, God knows this. He's the one who did it. The saints know it. It's actually a key to sanctity. You're not going to become holy unless you have a relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why? Because you're not going to be fully conformed to Jesus Christ unless you have a relationship with, with her. She's the one perfect blueprint, model, prototype of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. All God wants to hear come out of all your mouths is one word. It's already been said. You're never going to do it greater. Fiat. Be it done to me too. Me too. See, God's not a polygamist. There's one bridegroom and one bride. You have to conform to the pattern of the bride. You have to become, as St. Paul says, without blemish, spot, or wrinkle, holy and immaculate. That's at the core of Christianity. If you miss that, you're going to miss a whole bunch of stuff about Jesus and everything that he wants to give you. You're going to have a, a, an askewed understanding of who he is, what he taught, what the church is about, confession, the sacraments. You're going to be off. You may be right on many things, but if you don't know her, you're not going to fully, in the totality, know Jesus Christ. I guarantee you this. I guarantee you this. This is how God set it up. See, the saints know this. That's why as, as early as like St. Augustine, he talks about Mary being a mold of Christians. A mold. Saints centuries later would pick that theme up like St. Louis de Montfort, who would talk about the role of a Christian is to become docile, supple to the Holy Spirit and be poured into the Marian mold. Mary's not a cookie cutter. She's a saint maker. You're never, ever going to become holy according to how Jesus wants you to be holy unless you conform yourself to that mold. Nobody will ever be beatified or canonized who doesn't love the Blessed Virgin Mary. How can you become holy unless you pattern yourself off of this perfect, flawless model? There's only one. If I were to line up here to you St. Francis, St. Dominic, St. Benedict, St. Ignatius, all the great founders of religious communities, and say to them in your presence, brothers, why did you found your group? What would they say first? For Jesus Christ. Yes, because he's God. First, always, Mary's not God. What else you got, brothers? I guarantee you every single one of them would say that those who follow my charism, apostolate, spirituality, that they seek to become like Our Lady. Another Mary for Jesus. That's at the core of Christianity. 
St. Maximian Kolbe will say what? You have to become transubstantiated into the Immaculate. Whoa. Here's heresy, here's Colby. Like super close, right? <laughs> but that's where you get the good stuff, right? You retain your own identity, you're your own person, but you have to become like Our Lady. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. See, God knows it, the saints knows it. Who else knows it? Satan. He ain't stupid. He's a fallen angel. He's got angelic intelligence. It's just he's manipulative and tricky and, you know, very, very crafty with it. But he ain't dumb. He is well aware of what's in the good book about his face getting crushed by a woman's foot. That's why he hates her and everything associated with her. So a few years ago, I wrote a book and I was thinking, what do I call this thing? You know, I got a bunch of sweet titles I could put on this thing. But I kept reading in the saints, live under the mantle, place yourself under the mantle, under the mantle, under the mantle. So I'm like, that's it, under the mantle. That'll be the title of the book. And it was perfect. You know why? Because you know what Satan's been trying to do in Christianity for 2,000 years? Dismantle Christianity. See, it works perfect in English. If you take out Our Lady, Satan's not going to be afraid of you. Seriously. Whose foot is it again that crushes his face? Hers. Why? Because she's God? No, because God lives in her. God chooses to do it through her. That's why whenever you see most images of Mary standing on the serpent with her foot, she's pregnant because Jesus is there. He's the one who does it because he's God, but he chooses to do it through her. You have to live under the mantle. If you don't, you're going to be in big trouble. The world will get you. The pull of the world will get you. Your own weaknesses will get you. But if you live consecrated to Our Lady, if you live under her mantle, you're safe. doesn't mean you're not going to have trials and you're going to fall flat on your face. That's going to happen. But you're going to be protected. She will be there with you. Trust me, I know. You heard my little litany of getting kicked out of a foreign country, drugs, rehabs, and all that craziness. I would be such a dead man right now were it not for the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's no, I should be to toast right now and in a lake of fire because of my life. But because of that sweet woman, I now know Jesus Christ. I now got one of these strapped around my neck and on my own free will made vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I would have never done this had I not this beautiful woman before my eyes. Because every man has to fight for a beauty. I'm not here primarily to fight for an institution. I don't fight for Walmart, right? <laughs> Please. You fight for beauty, and you go and you slay dragons for that beauty. See, that's what we as all Catholics are we're supposed to be doing. And Our Lady will bring that dimension into your life. You know, we can't have any of this without Our Lady. Think about that. I mean, did you ever really sit down and like, think about that? Jesus is not a phantasm. He's not a robot. He didn't just appear. He chose to come to us through that woman. He could have done it in a million other ways. No doubt about that. But he didn't. And the fact that he didn't means that we are now dependent by causation. I could break down a whole bunch of Thomism stuff for you. We need her. She's not an option. She's an absolute necessity, an obligation in your spiritual life. Really. If you can't have Jesus without her, that means you can't have life without her. What did Jesus say? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. And where, does that, where did he get his flesh and blood? From the flesh and blood of Mary. Without Mary, you wouldn't have Jesus. Without Mary, you wouldn't have the Eucharistic body of Christ. Without Mary, you wouldn't have the mystical body of Christ, the church. You wouldn't have the sacraments, confession, the priesthood. You wouldn't have Jack without the Blessed Virgin Mary. Seriously, nothing. That's how important she is, guys. Oh my goodness, if people only knew this, but so many don't. Oh, I don't need her, she's not important. Why do you pay so much attention to her? Because Jesus did. You know what Therese and Maximian Colby say? Don't be afraid of loving her too much because you're never gonna love her more than Jesus does. It's logic, right? Again, I'm not God, but I'm a dude. I got a mom, right? If you came up to me and you said to me, Father, you know, your mom is amazing. She's such a beautiful lady. Would you mind if I gave her some roses? Would you mind if I wrote this little song uh, to your mom? Would you mind if I sang it? 
Oh, uh, I'd be a weird son if I said, how rude. I'm so offended. The horrible son would I be, right? I'm not upset by that. I'm, matter of fact, you know what? I, you would so move my heart, my, my human heart, that I would be like, wow, thank you so much. Is there anything I can do for you? See, if, if, if let's just say you were on my bus, those who honor my mother, why don't you come up to the front? Okay, I may let the other ones on, but you're gonna be in the back. It's gonna be a bumpy ride, okay? But if you, if you honor my mother, I'm gonna give you everything within my power to give you. Do you not think that Jesus wouldn't do this? Of course he would, he's not offended. No way, no how. See, this is why certain saints, and I love this, I love the saints, man, because they teach us certain things that are just so basic to understand. Did you know that St. Maximian Kobe, St. John Paul II, and St. Teresa of Avila, a doctor of the church, loved to play the game of chess. Did you know that? It's pretty cool. There's actually a picture, I know of at least one picture, of Colby playing chess with his novices. Pretty soon he's got the honking beard, you know, just came back from Japan. Why? What's up with that? Why do they like to play chess? Because it can teach us something about theology, like 101. Chess as we play it today comes out of a Catholic culture, right? Hopefully you know what I'm talking about here with chess. You, you guys are on the video games and stuff. You, uh, Okay, it's pretty simple. Black and white, it's all about this dude called the king. Okay, it's all about the king. Anybody who says the game of chess isn't about the king, they don't know what they're talking about. But, who's got the most mobility on the board? The queen. She can move any number of squares in any direction. And the king isn't jealous. He's not like, huh, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. He gave her that mobility. He delights in that mobility. And if you fight for the queen, you're fighting for him. And everybody knows that if you lose the queen, game over. But did you know, did you know that if just one bishop, just one, works with the queen on the battlefield, you can conquer the enemy in four moves? Did you know that? Really? See, the new evangelization ain't rocket science. All you gotta do is allow the queen mobility. It's her foot that crushes the enemy. But we come up with strategic planning programs and all these useless ways of trying to evangelize people when we need to bring them to her because she is the surest, fastest, and easiest way of bringing them to Jesus Christ. You don't have to be the next Fulton Sheen. Really? I mean, what, what did we venerate today? And that was so sweet, by the way. I had no idea that the heart of St. John Vianney was gonna be hanging out here, you know? Did you get, you guys saw that, right, at Mass? Whoa, I was just in Ars, France a couple months ago, and his heart wasn't there because he told me it was on tour, which was hilarious. <laughs> cool, like tour dates, Vianney's heart, tour dates, you know? Um, so he was here, I was like, oh, that's so sweet. I couldn't see him there, so he came here where I was. That's a pretty good deal. Little French dude, okay, not intimidating at all to look at, you know, St. John Vianney, but what gave that dude so much power? His love for Our Lady in the Eucharist, his availability of people, hearing confessions, duking it out with demons at night. Not that we're all called to that, you know, if, if a demon punches me, I'm going to Motel 8, you know, I'm out, I'm out, you know. I say that as a priest, that junk scares me, you know, but I'm, I'm out, you know, blood down the hall, I'm, I'm out, you know, I'm moving. With Our Lady, you can have power. You can have such an incredible, credible closeness to Jesus Christ, like that little French priest. You can transform hearts quickly, effectively. That's the ability that God has given to this woman. Okay, so she's our mother. We can't have nothing without her, which means she gives us life. She's our spiritual mother. What does a mother do for her children after she gives them life? She feeds them. You know, our mother does this for us in the most amazing way, really and truly. You know, if any of you are mothers or you're dreaming about motherhood or you, and you have a mother, you know that when you were a little child, your mother gave you broccoli and spinach and she was like, eat it, you'll grow up and be strong, right? Good, but it's not gonna give you everlasting life. Spinach, you know, you know put a few years on you, you know, but you're not gonna live forever. But imagine if there was a mother who had the ability to make a food that if her children ate that food, they would have everlasting life. Would you not want it? Sure you would. Well, there is a woman. There is a mother. This is what the saints say. 
that Mary's womb is an oven. And in that fiery hot sacred oven, Mama Mary makes for her children the bread of life. And if you eat this bread that Mama Mary made for you, you will live forever. See, that's why our Lord was born in Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean in Hebrew? House of bread. What does it mean in Aramaic, the language our Lord spoke? House of flesh or house of meat. Really? That's why our bread was placed in a manger. Manjare. Eat. Catholic Church didn't make this stuff up. This is how God gave it to us all through Mary. She feeds you. She wants you to live forever. You've got to be attentive to this. You've got to know the importance of her in your life. So after a mother gives life, after a mother feeds her children, what does every mother do? My mom did it. Your mom did it. She cleans her children. We are filthy. We make a mess of things. Okay, I'm going to get real descriptive here. When you were a child, you soiled yourself. You did. You made a mess of things a lot. It was nasty. Ooh, one of the nastiest smells ever, right? But you had to have the confidence that you're going to get cleaned up again and again and again and again every single time, like 70 times 7 a day. And it's free. What mother would say to her child, hey, five bucks. <laughs> this junk ain't free, right? No. That would be a horrible mother if you charge your child for a diaper change. You can't even pay for it, right? Or what mother would say, hey, I two hours ago I did this. I'm not, no, 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 go away. Tomorrow. No. And everybody knew when you did this, you can't act like, you, could, you ever see those videos on YouTube? It's hilarious. When everybody in the room can smell it, and the baby's like, <laughs> acting like it's clueless. You know, everybody is aware that, you know, what's going on here. You need to get cleaned up. See, this is what Our Lady does for us in the spiritual life. This is why, do you know what confession is for God's children? It's a spiritual diaper change. Okay? Really? You're never going to forget confession again now. You're going to remember that. Because you stink. You spiritually soil yourself a lot. It doesn't matter if you're 21 years old, 46 years old, or 82. You're going to make a mess of things all the time. Father God supplies the diapers and he gives them to his bride, an endless supply, and they're free of charge. And it's not something that's done public. Who goes into McDonald's and changes their baby on the counter? Nobody. <laughs> Same thing in God's house. You go behind a curtain where Mother Church, patterned off of Our Lady, cleans you up. You could go every single day if you had to, free of charge. You'd wear us priests out, but it could be done. This is how much God loves you, how he's given all these gifts to Our Lady to give to you. You know that the saints could smell the stench of sin on a soul? St. Padre Pio, St. Faustina even, could smell sin on a soul. Yikes, that would be a horrible gift to have, right? <laughs> give me that soul reading thing over that one, you know? Smelling sin, because it's horrible. And by the way, when you go for the spiritual diaper change, you go to get a complete deal. You don't say, just the left side. That's weird. It's a whole package, okay? So when you go to confession, you need to tell everything. You need to get everything out. They already know, but you need to have that humility to get it out. See, only those, and I say this, you know, with conviction, only those who know that they have a spiritual mother go to frequent confession. Ask a random Catholic on the street, excuse me, sir, you're Catholic, Cool. Do you go to confession? Oh, you don't? Do you have a relationship with Mary? Oh, you don't. Hmm, interesting. I wonder if there's a correlation. <laughs> you betcha there's a correlation. Those who have a devout, pious relationship with their spiritual mother will know where they can go to get a free spiritual diaper change. Really? This ain't rocket science. It ain't hard to figure out. When you stray from Our Lady, you'll start thinking crazy things like, yeah, I don't need to go and confess to some dude. I can just go directly to Jesus. Oh, you think you can, huh? Oh, sure you can. But you got no guarantee, no covenantal language of I absolve you through my bride. See, this is my house. This is what God says to us. 
you, you think you're some kind of hero that you can go and do it on your own when I've established my household for you with my woman, my lady, my wife, my bride. I've given this to you. Why are you not using it? Don't turn away from it. Don't run. Don't think so highly of yourself that you, you, you think there's another option for you because you're special. No. Take advantage of this. Our lady, if you have a relationship with her, will help you do this. Confession isn't always easy. That's for sure. Trust me. When there's a Nigerian priest in town, I hit him up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, sweet, you're here for a mission? All right, dude, you got time for a confession? Because uh, I'm going to dump some stuff on you, homie. All right? <laughs> you don't understand much English? Perfect. <laughs> I get it. I totally get it, right? Somehow I think heaven does too, you know? We're crazy, we're, we're, we're children, we're children. God loves that about us, okay? Our lady is that important for you in your spiritual life. You absolutely need her in your spiritual life. Is it always easy to pray the rosary on a daily basis? No, I've never prayed a, rosary, a perfect rosary in my life. I'm like the priest writing books on the rosary. I've written like five books on the rosary in the last four years. I've never prayed a perfect rosary. St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, everybody loves her. She talked about her struggles with the rosary. So many do. Man, I'm three Hail Marys deep into it, and I'm already forgetting which mystery I'm on. <laughs> really, I'm picking up smells. I'm like, ooh, did I respond to that? You know, I'm like, nope, nope, back. Bring it back, bring it back. But see, God will take whatever he can get, because we're children. When your mind gets distracted, just bring it back. And you know what? You know, in prayer one time, it came to me. When we do that, God is he's so good to us. He's such a good father. It's like we're giving him butterfly kisses. Like a little child, we get distracted, we're, ooh, what's that? And then we go, okay, I see you. And then we're back to distractions and we come back with a, a partially hail, prayed Hail Mary, you know. He'll take whatever we give him, okay? But we gotta give him. And Our Lady will package it up, she'll make it better. I love that story about uh, St. Juan Diego. This is a classic guy thing. A girl, if Our Lady had appeared to a girl, it wouldn't have went down this way probably. But she's like, here's, you know, you're gonna go to the bishop and you're gonna, you know, tell him what went down. So he's like, all right, cool. So he runs off. He's not worried about the, you know, how they're arranged. It's a dude. So our lady stops him. She's like, Juanito, hold on a minute. She rearranges them. Okay, pretty. Okay, now go. <laughs> right? He's a dude. He's like, whatever. You know, <laughs> so they, it doesn't matter. But our lady does. She makes things better. She puts her touch on it and everything is better, it's more beautiful, it's more presentable to our Lord. This is what he wants for us in our spiritual life. Okay, so remember at the beginning I talked about how if I were God, and I know that you would do this too, if you had a way to prevent your mother from dying and rotting in a tomb at six feet under, you'd do it, of course you would. Jesus did. When I was in seminary, I've been a priest almost 16 years now, so when I was in seminary, one of my brother priests, our brother seminarians, came to me with an article in the Washington Post, compost, and he said to me, dude, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm not afraid to offend people, by the way, so. So he's like, did you, dude, did you read this? And I'm like, what is it? So he says, you gotta check this out. So I started reading it, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, holy moly. I'm like, what the heck is this? It was just a secular, pure scientific thing, but it talked about this thing called, here's the word, fetal microchimerism. Write that puppy down, okay? Fetal microchimerism. The chimerism is C-H, not a K. Okay, it's a hard C-H. Fetal microchimerism. So, some scientist in different uh, universities around the world had discovered this on just a secular level. They were doing studies on women in uh, like Sweden, even in Washington State and a couple places around the world simultaneously uh, you know, on, on, on women. And they discovered that during these uh, research, some of the women got sick because it was a long-term study. And they found that there were cells in these women's bodies, living cells that were not hers. And they were like, okay, this is interesting. What do we make of this? And they discovered that when these women were sick, they thought, well, these cells, through their studies, are the cells of her children. Now, some of these women had not been 
a mother in, in the physical sense of having a baby in them recently at all, like a long time ago. But they discovered that there was the cells of their children, living cells, still in her body. But they thought, well, this doesn't bode well for motherhood. It looks like the cells of her children are causing the illness. This is not good. They kept studying. Guess what they discovered? Oh, it, that's not the case. It's the opposite. When a mother becomes sick, the cells of her children, all the children she's had, rush to the area of her body to fight for her life. Scientifically proven, fetal microchemism. Whoa! But he, some amazing things were discovered as well, other than that. Many of these women, when they were having the testing done, didn't put down that they were mothers. So the scientists were confused because uh, there are cells in your body that are not yours, and you didn't put that you were a mother. This is weird. Well, they were, but you know, they didn't put certain things on there. Maybe out of embarrassment or just, you know, it's, it's difficult to deal with. Miscarriage, right? So many women experience that, but you're a mother. But they didn't put it on there. But then it was understood, oh, okay, well, you, you were a mother, right? And uh, you had the baby there for a period of time because this cellular exchange happens within the first trimester of the pregnancy. Amazing stuff. But then there were others who said that they didn't have a miscarriage. You know what they said they had had? An abortion. Yeah. Making, obviously, the wrong decision, terminating the pregnancy, taking the life of the child, a horrible decision, of course. But you're a mother. And isn't it ironic that the life that was terminated now fights for yours? Yeah, scientifically proven, fetal microchimerism. And you know, the studies are still being done because they found that women still, in their old age, still have cells of their children alive in their bodies, fighting for them. This is mind-blowing stuff, mind-blowing. One of the scientists and one of these articles, because after that I did a whole bunch of research, one of them was kind of making a funny, he said, you know, we've always thought that mothers have a, 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 an intuition, a sixth sense. My mother would. I could come home and be faking a smile, and she'd be like, Johnny, what's wrong? I'm like, how do you do that? How do you know, right? Well, this guy said, it's not like mom's watching over your shoulder. She's in your shoulder. <laughs> Why? Because it happens both ways. All of you right now have living cells of your mother in your body right now. Even if your mother is no longer here, she's already deceased. She's still here on a cellular level, in your body. That's amazing. You know, sometimes people will say in life, and rightly so, it's just we never fully understood it, if a mother experiences the death of a child or when like a child experiences the death of a mother, what do we say? Part of me died when my mom died. <laughs> yeah, literally. Now, scientifically, this is proven. This is incredible. But see, there's a particular mother and child that weren't in that article, because that was just secular talk. But see, Jesus isn't a robot, an angel, a phantasm. He's the God-man, human nature, full components of manhood. Our Lady gave him what he was needed from those chromosomes, and Heavenly Father supplied the rest in some way we don't fully understand, but he wasn't anything other than a full man, human nature, the God-man. He has all of it. So. There's a cellular exchange that took place between Mary and her son. So when the angel came to her and said, Hail, hey, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Uh-huh, yeah, right, for the next nine months for sure. But even after he enters into the world, he still remains in her body on a cellular level. Our Lady is a walking, living tabernacle, a monstrance. That's why so many saints will say, and mystics, that when Our Lady and St. Joseph took the, the baby Jesus to, to Egypt, fleeing from Herod, the idols of Egypt fell. Because Our Lady went as a, it was a Eucharistic procession, basically, of the body of Christ into pagan territory. Whoa! That's amazing stuff. That's why St. Joseph is the terror of demons, and so is Our Lady. When Our Lady comes upon the scene, she never comes alone. And if those cells that from us God puts in our mother's body will fight for our mother's life, whose cells are those again in the body of Mary? Oh yeah, God. 
Is Mary going to experience a corruption in a tomb? Never. God loves his mother so much he implanted himself in her body. See, this is why, from the beginning of the church, we have never talked about a resurrection of Mary, ever. August 15th, we don't celebrate the resurrection, we celebrate the assumption, or the dormition. In Spanish, dormir, what does that mean? To sleep. The transitus Mariae in the early church, and you'll have artistic depictions of it. Many of them are, are apocryphal, and they're just trying to figure it out, but they get it wrong. We've never approved those apocryphal renditions. We've never celebrated a resurrection of Mary. Why? Because she never died. Not like you and I die. Many will talk about her experiencing a death, but it's not the same kind of death that you and I will experience. We die because of sin. She experiences a passing, a transition, a dormition, a falling asleep that you can call death, but it's not like you and I. God put himself inside her because he loves her that much. I would have done the exact same thing if I were God. Well played, God, well played. <laughs> if I had the ability to do that, wouldn't you do that? If you could do that for your dear mother? God did. Another sign of how special this woman is, of what a masterpiece of motherhood and femininity she is. Don't be afraid of loving Mary too much. You're never going to love her more than Jesus. When I was ordained 16 years ago, I'll end with this, because i got a time up here somewhere. I think I'm out, about out of time. When I was ordained, I was driving in the Massachusetts Turnpike, and I saw a bumper sticker. It was brilliant theology. I don't know who it was. I drove up to the guy. He probably thought I was a lunatic because I was tailgating him, trying to find out who, who, who owns this car. This dude's brilliant. You know what it said? Wise men still find him with his mother. Yeah, that's brilliant theology, my friends. See, when those wise men and shepherds came to that cave, they found Jesus in the arms of Mary. And you know what they didn't do? They didn't say, who are you, woman? You're insignificant. Step aside. That's called kidnapping. <laughs> Bad. And if you kidnap that baby, that's not an ordinary baby. That's the God baby, OK? If you want that baby, you got to humble yourself. And you got to ask Mary, can I hold him? Can I smother him with kisses? Can I? put my lips into his little baby divine fat belly. <laughs> See, this baby loves you so much, he was born to be consumed by you. We love babies, right? When we see a baby, we all get silly. I'm going to eat you up. Yum, 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 I'm gonna eat you up. <laughs> we don't eat babies. That's a problem. That would be a serious issue. <laughs> but this one was born to be consumed. Mary's baby. Mama Mary's baby, born for you to give you eternal life. So you keep praying those rosaries. Don't you think you can walk away from Mary and do this? You can't. If you struggle with it, pray about it. If you struggle with the rosary, pray a decade a day. Build, build up the strength to get to the whole thing. But don't walk away from this masterpiece of maternity, because God made her for you. God bless you, my friends. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.